Hello everyone. So it's great to be with you. I haven't done this uh, for quite some time. And you know, it's the, um, it's the time of the Jewish New Year, uh, the Rosh Hashanah, in another three or four days. Um, and it's a good time to reflect and to be in gratitude. So I'm doing some of that. Um, and I'm calling this film Tribute to one of my greatest teachers. You know, um, after my, uh, well, <laughs> my incredible um, accident uh, when I was 17, um, life, of course, seemed over. And, of course, I would, uh, at, when I was young, I, had lo I, was, I was strong, I was a lifeguard, and I had lost everything. It seemed to me at the time, and I, uh, if I, I had hope for some time of uh, getting return in some of my body. But if I had known uh, that it wouldn't happen very much, I would not have, I didn't want to stay, and I, uh, um, when that hope faded, which it did, I didn't want to stay, and um, and I was looking for any way to get out. Of course, without arms and hands, um, uh, ending ending one's life is complicated. So I'm calling this film tribute to one of my greatest teachers, and you know I've had a lot of very great teachers. A lot of them are people I've met. Um, wonderful people who, who took care of me, or you know, in nurses, or physical therapists, or people that, that gave me hope and strength along, along the way, um, especially during those first two years of being in different, or two and a half years of being in different hospitals and rehabs. and. Um, but some of my teachers are, are, are great, great creators, great creative uh, artists, thinkers, who, um, who left a great legacy to the world. Uh, specifically, I, for me, uh, I was really helped by reading the works of Lev Tolstoy, um, especially um, well, the great, his great works, Anna Karenina and um, um, War and Peace, but also his amazing short stories. Short stories, you read those short stories like the death of Ivan Ilyich, and, and um, well, you can never be the same after reading that one in particular, and that's not the only one. Um, so he was a big one for me, and... Um, well, uh, the biblical writers, after my accident, when I was stuck in one of the rehabs and, and just stuck uh, and feeling, what is it all for? I, uh, reading the Bible. Um, first the Old Testament and then the Gospels. The Gospels of the New Testament, they it gave me a lot of power and a lot of strength. It made me think about things differently than I had before. And um, so, and, and then uh, when I got my BA at home, I studied in my parents' home. I came home from the hospitals and I studied for a, sort of a home study BA in uh, psychology. I read a lot of psychology and a lot of Sigmund Freud. And that was great help, actually, because it helped me to understand the dynamic unconscious and what motivates us sometimes at very deep levels that we're not aware of. And, um, and so that was, uh, all of these things were critical in um, developing a will to live um, and surviving. So this film is dedicated to one of the very greatest teachers 
uh, also who I've never met, who, uh, named, well, it's a very famous person, his name. His name is Michael Landon. Okay, now that, that might surprise a lot of people who don't really know his work because, uh, well, he was a very good-looking Hollywood star. Um, and people think of him as, uh, in, uh, as being just another superficial, good-looking Hollywood star. But he was, he was much more than that. And he left a creative work behind him, which I know is having a huge effect on the world. I'm specifically I mean, um, his two late, his last serials, uh, Little House on the Prairie and Highway to Heaven. And he was not only the, the lead actor, but he was the um, producer, director, um, creative genius behind these extremely powerful programs, uh, which uh, actually would inspire me and move me deeply day after day as I as I was sort of um, in my parents home in despair and I would watch these programs especially Little House on the Prairie and some of the episodes are incredibly powerful and incredibly moving and um, and I would learn about I, I really learned I think about how life should be led from from his work. So he was not he was the producer, the director of many and the writer of many of the episodes, the writer of the scripts. And uh, the ones he wrote actually uh I was I I am convinced were the very best. There were other great writers. So it's not only his work but others who also wrote for the series, who I'm mean, just amazingly powerful, um, moving things. That that I was ready, you know. I was, you know, when you're you're when you're in despair, um, you're looking for 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 light. You're looking for something. Um, and anyway, that program, and to a lesser extent later, Highway to Heaven. Um, they gave me big inspiration. And um, so, this is a film in tribute to him, to Michael Landon, but it's uh, maybe more about, uh, well, it's as much about me as it is about him. Okay, now, um, my first encounter with uh, the idea that, may, that there was something very, very valuable in, in this program, which is called Little House on the Prairie, was I had a biology teacher, I was in about 15 in the 10th grade, named Mr. Kelly. And Mr. Kelly, uh, he was a, a tough Irish-American teacher, and he, um, he, didn't, um, he didn't pull any punches, and he didn't hold back from uh, delivering uh, his teaching in the very best way he could, and he would always talk in front of the class about Little House on the Prairie, and he would always encourage us to watch us, to watch it, and um, and you know, and, and I remember that we're, the, the kids we would sort of laugh, and some would make the joke, "Oh, a little fairy on the prairie," and. Um, I don't know how, if anybody followed his advice, but I know now he was giving that advice regularly. He would talk about the different episodes and uh, the things that had happened. This was a 10th grade honors biology. And um, he was doing it because he knew very well, uh, he, like I know now, that there was deep magic, deep lessons, important lessons important lessons about opening the heart, about loving, about how to live a life, that were being um, communicated through that show in the most powerful way. And um, so I had a biology teacher, 
um, a, a year before my accident, who would regularly talk about this show. Now, when I think back, why did I never turn on the program even once, even for a minute, just to check it out? Um, I know why. I know why. It was, it was my very, very fragile teenage um, male ego, okay? The problem was the name. The name, Little House on the Prairie. Okay, now, if it had been named Bloody House on the Prairie, I would have tried. If it had been named Big House on the, on the Prairie, I would have tried it. If it had been named House on the Prairie, I would have tried that because I loved history. That was really the thing I was really good at back then. And, uh, but it was the little, I couldn't couldn't handle that little, and so I never even turned it on. Oh well, I wish I had listened to Mr. Kelly. I don't know, it probably wouldn't have made much difference. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, he talks about the phrase, uh, hungry ghosts. Hungry ghosts who have no, who can't, they have no spiritual food. And so they're hungry all the time and searching, searching searching and I was sort of a young teenage hungry ghost like many 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 who are who have nothing to really fulfill them who don't know about spirit you know I was brought up in a, a cultural religious home but it was culture it wasn't true spirituality um, some Jewish people have a real spiritual background but uh, a lot of them do, but for me, we just, you know, we'd go to the synagogue on the, the big holidays and keep a kosher home, and that was it. We didn't really believe in any of it. It was culture, okay? So, yeah, I was like a hungry ghost. Anyway, uh, the next thing. When I was uh, about me, and then I'll switch on to who Michael Landon was. One more thing about me, at 17 and a half, had my accident. I dove in, off of a lifeguard stand. I was working as a lifeguard. I was 17. And I was trying to do a you know, fancy dive to impress a, a pretty girl in a yellow bikini. Um, and um, I wasn't paying much at attention to the dive. It was when my shift was over. In other words, I was supposed to, what everybody did is they dove into the water and then swam to the next shift on the next stand, and you go from stand to stand. So it was relatively narrow, I didn't pay attention, and I hit, my I hit the floor with my forehead, and c'est la vie. Um, so I was in, I set the record of being the longest in intensive care in Good Samaritan Hospital in Rockland County, New York. Um, yeah, they, we, uh, they told me I, well, I was the record holder, uh, nothing to be proud of. But I was there, I don't know, nine months, 10 months, 11 months, a year, a uh, long, long time. And um, that was a dark existence, even though they were beautiful, wonderful people who were taking care of me. I, I remember them well, my nurses. And at a certain point, they brought in a color TV, a little one on a, on a you know, one of these uh, flexible metal arms. And uh, I would end up watching a lot of TV, a lot of game shows. There was nothing else on, but there was one thing on, I think between 11 and 12 in the morning, called Bonanza. And on Bonanza, there was the young Michael Landon. He hadn't developed into the director, writer, producer, yet. Um, yet there were some, already there were some powerful episodes in that early series from the 60s, Bonanza. And it was sort of the light of my day, watching Bonanza. Um, and he played the youngest brother of three brothers to a father. And uh, still a good series, not as good as his later stuff. Um, so there, there was another connection 
And um, one more thing about about uh, my experience with this great teacher. Um, and before I start talking about who he was, uh, when I came home to my parents, my parents' home in New York, um, the house had been part of the house, a room and and a deck had been rebuilt so I could come in, in my wheelchair, in my bed. And um, they made it nice for me. My parents went all out and also New York State was very generous also. I was workman's comp and that was good luck. Uh, to be injured on the job, you get taken care of better. So, um, one day I was bored and miserable, frustrated, and I turned on the TV, just dumb, out of the blue, to his channel, and I just happened to turn it on to a program that I would later learn was Little House on the Prairie. And in that episode, the very first time I'd ever looked at it, um, Nellie Olson, uh, the, the tremendously spoiled and mean blonde girl, um, was pretending that she was badly injured and paralyzed after falling from a horse. And she, she was blaming it on this sweet uh, her heroine of the, of the series, Laura. And so um, she was ma manipulating everyone, her parents and Laura, who was, was, had a, a small role in her fall. And she was pretending to be a quadriplegic, or no, a paraplegic. That means the legs. Quadra is four. And, um, and her mother would buy her these uh, dolls from France. And anyway, Laura saw her once out of her wheelchair. She thought nobody was watching, and she was dancing with one of her dolls. And uh, it, it ended very funny. And um, one of the humorous episodes, the different kinds of episodes, Anyway, I thought, wow, isn't that weird? A program about somebody pretending to be paralyzed. And um, it would like, well, it, I, it struck me. The subject really struck me. And I thought, I thought there's some kind of message here. I didn't know what. I also had a dream. The night after my accident, I had a dream that uh, I was pretending. And. Um, Anyway, it's, so, okay, so those were the early um, antecedents of my, of my connection with something that I actually is, was hugely important for me. Um, by the way, I saw an interview with that actress who played the, uh, Nellie Olson, who, uh, the, no, who played Nellie, the, the, the mean, spoiled, rich uh, little blonde girl. And she said that Little House had developed all over the world. This was many years after the show had finished, around 2002. She was an adult and she was being interviewed. And she said that there, were, there was a huge worldwide following for the show and uh, the reruns. And, um, and that among the... Um, the group, the, the huge uh, amount of people who love the show, there is a, a section of people who, uh, uh, that she has met. There's a whole big section who say that their lives were saved or healed uh, by watching Little House. And I knew that had happened to me, that something very deep and powerful had happened to me. But to hear her say, in, in 2002, in an interview, that there's a whole big group of uh, people who claim they were healed from cancer or healed from whatever um, uh, affliction was afflicting them, or that their uh, broken hearts were somehow um, eased or healed. That is what happened to me. And to hear her say, uh, that there are many, many, um, it, well, it doesn't really surprise me. Um, because, well, so, okay. So who was this man? 
who would have such a, a profound impact on the world. Michael Landon, um, the reruns are showed to this day all over the world and hugely popular. Uh, um, some years ago until uh, maybe even now, I know it was very big in India, all over Europe, very big in France, um, all over the world in Israel where I live. Uh, it was for some years when I had first come here in the 90s. And um, so, I mean, he, had, he has had a huge effect, Michael Landon. Well, who was he? He was born Eugene Orowitz in Englewood, New Jersey. To, um, his dad was Jewish, his mom was Catholic, and they fought all the time. And he had, um, he had a, tough, a tough childhood. Um, there is a movie, uh, maybe on the YouTube, um, called Sam's Son, okay? Like, like the biblical hero Samson, but it's a play on words. Sam's son, his father was named Sam, and he was his son. And um, this, it's about the, it's an autobiography movie about the early life of Eugene Orowitz, Michael Landon. And you know, he had a, um, an amazing, miraculous, truly miraculous youth, um, but it was hard. Um, one thing that was hard about it is he was a bedwetter, okay? And his mother, his mother apparently was a hard person. And as a teenager or as a young, young boy, um, early teenage, teenage, I think, he would still wet the bed. You know, you, you can't, people have this problem. It, it's, uh, it's not easily controlled. And his mother, to get him to stop doing it as if he was choosing, she would hang the, the urine stained sheets in front of the home so that she could publicly, so that the people going by would know, would see, and in this way by publicly humiliating him, she hoped to force him to cut it out. She was a tough person, his mother, and um, which is why I suppose his parents separated, they divorced. Um, when he was uh, a young man. Uh, anyway, his father ran a cinema, which was hard work. Very hard. Why was it hard work? It, Michael spoke about it in an interview, um, that he would have to lug up these heavy metal film, film reels up the steps to the top of the cinema house many times during the day, up and down. And uh, it took a big toll on his father. And so in this movie about his life, Sam's son, which I recommend if you could find it, the, this, the film I think begins with the scene of the father and the son, the young Eugene, sitting in a dark theater, and they had just, together, they were alone in, this, in the theater. Um, they had finished the movie Samson um, for the umpteenth time. Okay, maybe everybody had left and they had just finished the movie, and Eugene says to his dad, do you think it's really true that there really was a Samson and that he really that God gave him power through his hair? And do you think it really did happen? Um, and the father answered in the scene, well, it's in the Bible, so it must be true. So th this, uh, so the, 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 what happened is the young Eugene started growing his hair just I suppose, after having seen the movie many times um, with his dad, that maybe, maybe, it is, maybe such a thing could be. 
And I saw Michael Landon talk about it on Johnny Carson. Um, he started getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And kids who were messing at him, uh, messing with him in his private, uh, he went to a private boys' school called McBurney in New Jersey. Very few Jews. Uh, not easy to be a Jew in that school at that time, he explained. Um, my father went to that school, oddly enough, another little interesting karmic um, thing there. So anyway, he started getting strong, very strong. He went out for the track team. And he became very, very good at throwing the javelin, okay? You know, the, the metal spear. And, um, well, what, what happened? Well, for one, people stopped to bother him because he, he was becoming very strong. And on the very last track meet of his high school career in his senior year, and it's, it's portrayed really wonderfully in the movie, he threw the javelin and set a world record. Now, this is never done that a high school kid not only did he break the world record on that last meet of his career as a senior, but he totally shattered the world record. And um, I saw him explain on Carson that actually, since, uh, since those days, when he held the world record, which, he ha which was for a long time, the record stood. Um, eventually, they changed the material that the javelin is made of. So the javelin is different today. And the, his world record in it, with that particular javelin was never broken. So anyway, that, that, as you might imagine, opened doors for him. He got he received a full scholarship, a full athletic scholarship after that world record. Of course, he would have had many offers. Um, they would have all wanted him. But he chose UCLA. He had a full athletic scholarship. And he went with his father. His father um, left the mother. They had been, like I said, fighting all the time. And they went to California together. Now, UCLA, not, not very synchronistically, is near Hollywood, okay? He had to go to UCLA. He had to break that record. He had to get to Hollywood. Um, and he did. He says when he got to UCLA, this was back in the 1950s, and he had this really long hair. And like, well, and boys at that time didn't have long hair. They had crew cuts, okay? And like the biblical story, um, the, the other guys on the team, they don't like, you know, they, 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 they all jumped him, held him down, and cut his hair. Because what, you're going to have long hair? When everybody has a crew cut, who do you think you are? So anyway, they cut his hair. Michael explained on that show, Carson, that he never threw well again. Not really, he never really threw good again when they cut his hair. So that's an amazing story. It's, it's, a, um, it's an epic, biblical proportion story. Um, and, um, and, and you know, I think about all of his life, you know, all the great things that he did, um, you know, uh, landing the, the role on Bonanza first in the 60s, which was a good show, and then doing his own shows in the 70s and in the 80s, uh, Little House and Highway to Heaven. It's like always, it, that was a repetition of that incredible javelin throw that shattered the world record. So um, he... He did it in much more meaningful ways, uh, I think, 
no doubt. Um, but uh, I see that as a theme, that, that tremendous throw of his life. Anyway, um, why? Why are these two shows so special for millions of people to this day? The, rerun, the reruns continue. And, uh, and the, Christian, uh, the Christian network here in Israel until recently showed Highway to Heaven um, from the 80s. It's a powerful and beautiful show. Once, uh, when I was back at home in the early 80s, seemingly uh, by mere coincidence, but it was synchronicity, I happened to turn on the TV again to a show that I didn't usually watch. This, it was a Christian show called The 700 Club, okay, with Pat Robertson. And um, on that program, the, the, a woman interviewed, interviewed um, Michael Landon. And Michael Landon talked about something, a terrible incident that happened to his family. His daughter, who was a teenager at the time, his daughter was in a terrible accident. She was in a car, she was a teenager, she was in a car with five other teenagers, and the other five teenagers were killed. I don't remember if he said that if the driver was high or on booze or on drugs, but I, I kind of think so. Anyway, they were all killed except his daughter who was in a coma for quite a while. And Michael explained on the show, the Christian show, that, that he, he prayed to God and he, he prayed that if God would bring his daughter back to him and to his family, to life, if he would bring her back, then he would dedicate the rest of his life to making programs that would declare the greatness of God, the greatness of human beings, as, as the children of God and the greatness of this world as, as the creation of God. He made, a, he made a pledge to God. And, sure enough, his daughter came out of the coma. And in the very final year of Little House, um, I think the eighth or the ninth year, you see the daughter, she plays the teacher in the one-room schoolhouse, which is also the church. It's a little town, Walnut Grove. It's, it's even a village, it's not even a town. Uh, a, um, a real place, a real place in Minnesota and um, based on the writings of a real author who was the little girl in the little house on the prairie. Um, that those were, those, it was based on the books of Laura Ingalls Wilder, uh, very famous books, and uh, well, much more famous thanks to Michael Landon, Eugene Horowitz. So, um, and anyway, the daughter w came out, and Michael, his first, his project after that was the little house on the prairie. And um, you know, it's a great name. It's too bad that the name Little scares males away, like it, like it did me. But it does. You know, I mean, I have wonderful people helping me, including Rolando. And he doesn't even know the show, but he makes he makes the joke once, I remember, Little Fairy on the Prairie. And, and I remember that joke from, people make that joke who've never ever 
looked at the show. And I remember it from Mr. Kelly's class. So um, too bad that the word little is so, so frightening uh, to the egoic mind, to the, ego, to the egoic mind. But c'est la vie, all things are changing now. The whole world is in rapid change, uh, good change. And uh, the enlightenment is upon us. So, um, okay, uh, a little more about Michael, Eugene Michael. No, I'll call him Michael because that's, that's the name he chose and it's a beautiful name. It's an angelic name with tremendous power that he lived up to in, in a beautiful way. So, um, what else makes him stand out? Well, he was a tremendous advocate of saying no to drugs. And you know, um, it's like I was guided. I would, turn on, I would turn on programs that I would almost never watch. And def- exactly on those programs that one day out of the blue I turned on, there would be Michael Landon. And you know, um, he was like no other interview of no other celebrity. He, uh, I, and I saw him several times on Johnny Carson, on Merv Griffin, on, well, on that Christian program once, and um, others. I was guided to the interviews, no doubt. And he was this tremendously passionate advocate for saying no to drugs, to fighting drugs on, on a national level. He was with Nancy Reagan, the president's wife. They were the two leaders of the famous Just Say No campaign in the 1980s. His daughter was, I do believe she was, under the influence, as were the others, in that car. and. It broke his heart. It broke his heart, all the youth, all the youth who are destroying their, destroying their lives, ah, stupidly, for no good reason. I saw a lot in the rehabs. I saw kids who had been in motorcycle accidents, who had driven when they were high, or, or in cars, or who had, who had suffered brain injury uh, from accidents uh, being under the influence. And of course the drugs themselves are, can be so dangerous, never mind about a vehicle or, or not. Um, so he was this hugely um, passionate voice um, urging people to just say no. And of all the Hollywood community, he was the one uh, who joined Nancy Reagan in this huge nationwide campaign, which I'm sure did a lot of good. Um, so, so he was special. His interviews were completely different than other celebrity interviews I had watched over those eight years I was in my parents' home before I came to Israel. And... Um, and it inspired me, it inspired me. And, and you would see the theme come up in some of his, uh, his films, his uh, programs, in, also in Little House on the Prairie and also in Highway to Heaven. And um, it inspired me um, to see this warrior of light who, who cared at such a deep level uh, and dedicated his life um, to spreading the message that, that life can be beautiful, that life can be good, and that God exists, and that you don't need drugs. So, um, so he was my hero during those dark years of, uh, of finding meaning to my life. And I would watch these episodes day after day, the reruns, of course, day after day. And even one more a little funny karmic synchronicity. You know, the, the ratings for the TV shows are, are done by um, 
this, this famous Nielsen company. And uh, they send these little booklets to very, very certain, they do a lottery of families or of ho homes. And the odds of getting chosen as a, a Nielsen family, getting to rate in one of these books what you watch and what you don't watch, the odds are extremely tiny. I mean, uh, thousands to one. Um, they take a small percentage of the homes with televisions, a tiny percentage, and uh, are chosen randomly to to get one of these booklets and and vote on what they what they fill in. It's a journal what you watched and what you didn't watch, and so you, it's a lot of power uh, to be chosen and and to so anyway, the odds are really tiny. But I was, my, my family or I was chosen. I guess it was my family. We were chosen as a Nielsen family for one week. We got a book, a little Yeoman diary, to fill out exactly what we watched and what we didn't watch. And so I would have it filled out. I, I just lied. I would write that 10 people watched The Little House, uh, which was like the maximum. Every single time it came on the air, which is five weekdays in the week. Or it may have been for a month. I don't know. It was many years ago. So it's like the universe <laughs> uh, gave me that to, to, help, to help pay back and help hopefully to keep that show on in New York for as long as, as, I, as it could. It went on for many years, the reruns in New York. Who knows today? I'm here 23 years. So... Um, just a little interesting, I think, for me. Detail, not important. Except karma works like that. It's a karmic setup. What you focus on grows. That's what Seth said. That's what Abraham, uh, Abraham of Esther Hicks teaches, Law of Attraction. So, okay, so he was a completely special person. Um, and it, to hear him speak, it was immediate. To watch his films, it was immediately clear that this was something completely different. Um, okay, so... Okay, before closing, I'd just like to talk a little bit about his final, final series, Highway to Heaven, which he did in the 1980s with his friend and... Um, his, his deep friend, Victor French, who had also appeared in uh, Little House. Uh, and in, uh, in his final series, Highway to Heaven, he actually plays an angel named Jonathan. And he, um, he would show up in all of a sudden, sort of as a regular human being in disguise. He was an angel in disguise always. Uh, at a time of crisis, in people's lives, from the mili for whatever reason, um, and he would be uh, he would be like this uh, beautiful friend to them, and somehow would help them out of their crisis. And that was the theme of the show, and uh, it was beautiful and powerful, and. Um, couple of things about that show. When there was a quadriplegic character named Scotty, I remember him, uh, who appeared in the show several times, several episodes. Michael, um, there, I remember from an article I once read about him. Um, these, the, the little hero, or the diffident hero, who, who doesn't really have much going for him, seemingly on the outside, or even it seems like there's everything going against him. These, these little heroes who, who don't give up and who, who get ignored maybe and are not seen as heroes by anyone, but yet they are, these, these type of people meant, meant everything to Michael Landon. As it said in that TV Guide article, I think from 1984. Um, and so, the show, I remember there were several episodes devoted to real children 
like that real quadriplegic man, to real children who had cancer. Okay, I know Michael was very active in raising money for children with cancer and for research. And so you would see on some of the shows, he dealt with it on some of the shows. And um, he goes to a camp, the angel Jonathan goes to a camp of these cancer ridden, bald headed children. And a few of the kids, uh, then that was a couple of episodes, and a few of the kids appeared in several, Mamash, really several of the episodes that you would see, some of these real life children. And so this type of, I mean, this was a big theme for him, uh, uh, helping these children, I know. And um, in the end, uh, what, now, he wasn't a perfect person. Like all of us, what I know, he was, he was very faulted. He had three, I think, not less than three uh, different wives and three different families by each of those women. And I think he was um, probably very hard in some ways, hard to live with. Because he pushed himself. What's very clear to me is he uh, also Alison Angstrom, the, the grown-up interview with Nellie, uh, who was her, whose real life name is uh, Alison Angstrom or Angstrom. I don't know. Maybe Angstrom. Um, she um, she said he he was an extremely hard worker, as he must have been being producer director writer, um, creative force. There were even three series uh, that he was doing at one point. Something also called, something excellent also, called Father Murphy at one point. So uh, there were two going on at the same time. And then Highway to Heaven some years later. Three years of that lasted. Little House lasted a long time. Uh, actually nine years. Um, so he was an extremely hard worker. And he was probably quite not easy to live with. Um, he probably, as I understand, had a self-righteous streak. And so he had three different families by three different women. I mean, after getting divorced, not at the same time. He wasn't a bigamist. Um, so it's not about... Um, being perfect. This film, for me, is about gratitude. And um, for me to say thank you, wherever you are, my great teacher. Um, in 1990, well, I don't know when he developed it, but he, I saw a press conference with him on Entertainment Tonight, which I also almost never watched then. It was around 91 or 92. And there, a, he had given a press conference by the ocean. He lived in Malibu, in a home right near the ocean. And he had given a press conference with the ocean behind him, and he spoke very coolly and very calmly about the fact that he had inoperable liver cancer and that he was dying. And um, I remember that interview well. He didn't shed a tear, though there is certainly no shame in that. And his, his beautiful uh, legacy is all about opening the heart and being willing to cry um, in, in, uh, in a true cathartic, cathartic, powerful learning experience. But he, on that, I remember the, uh, the press conference. He was cool. 
matter of fact. He said he had this inoperable cancer. And to please not try to uh, send him any cures or tell him about any um, miracle cures because he had tried it all. And, um, and he was at peace with the process that he was going through. I know he didn't believe in death. And um, he, didn't, he didn't say one, uh, one way or the other during the press conference. But, but you can see that this was a tremendously strong man. I know it wasn't easy. I, I saw his son interviewed. And it was, he became very weak and he was in considerable pain. But um, I think, perhaps, he was so involved with um, children with cancer, and he had seen many, I'm sure, die. They were his friends. I, I kind of think he probably identified. I know this happens identified with them and he identified with all of the um, the down and out the down and outers of this world who nevertheless struggle to go on so so maybe that's because there are always it's always many many reasons the soul chooses when to leave and how to leave so he left in the early, early 90s. I think it was around 91, 90, 91, maybe 92. Um, but his legacy remains. And um, perhaps even on the YouTube for free, but who knows. Um, <laughs> and thank you. Thank you all for watching. Thank you, Michael Landon, Eugene Orowitz. I know that you are well and that you live. The body dies and we do not. And thank you for what you've left to, uh, for all the world and for what you've um, meant in my own life. So, God bless you all and God bless, God bless this beautiful world and all the people and all the beings. Thank you.